Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Simon Salt. In a faraway place at the northernmost tip of Iceland, but a short snowball's throw from the Arctic Circle, lies a tumble-down village by the name of Trollvik, where the sun never shines and the ragged, pallid village folk wear ghostly grey faces of stone that tell of their sorrow and fear. For as legend has it, Trollvik is home to the terrifying, flesh-eating trolls of the North. A thousand years ago, Trollvik was a prosperous fishing port. One dark night, however, in the middle of winter, the villagers were woken from their beds by a baleful howling that split the night air like a woodchopper's axe. Believing it was wolves, the elders gathered their people inside the church and bolted the doors. We're safe in here, said Thor, their leader. The wolves cannot pass through stone walls, but there was something unnatural about the howling that made him afraid. It sounded like the wolves were laughing at them. The villagers, however, trusted Thor and sang songs to drown out the baying. When it stopped, they cheered and toasted their leader for saving their lives. But when there was a knock at the door, they froze with fear. Who goes there? bellowed Thor. Help! came the pitiful reply. Help us, please. It's a trick, whispered the elders to their leader. The wolves have disguised their voices. We mustn't let them in. What do you want? shouted Thor cautiously. We are a family of gypsies, was the desperate response. The wolves have attacked our caravan and dragged off our children. In the name of God, save us before we are all killed. Thor was unsure what to do. If he let these gypsies in and they were wolves, he would be condemning his people to certain slaughter. But if the gypsies were telling the truth... Just then, a flickering red light danced in the stained glass windows of the church, and the gypsies redoubled their cries. They have set fire to our caravan, they wailed. We beseech you to let us in. Open the doors, commanded Thor. The villagers did as they were bid. When the bolts had been drawn back and the doors edged open, Thor saw to his relief a shabby family of travellers standing outside in the snow. But the flaming caravan was nowhere to be seen. Thor realised too late that he had been deceived, for just as he cried out, Beware! The church doors were rebolted, and the gypsies were inside. But they were not gypsies. Shedding their brightly coloured clothes and human shape, they transformed into a pack of snarling, slavering beasts, wet-lipped, razor-toothed monsters from Beelzebub's bottomless pit, with powerful, crushing jaws and matted fur that stank to high heaven. We are doomed, wept the elders, as the villagers panicked and sought refuge behind the altar. They are wolves. Not wolves, snarled the leader of the beasts as his soldiers surrounded the quaking crowd. We are much more powerful. Locked doors cannot keep our magic out. What do you want? asked Thor bravely, pushing himself to the front. A home growled the leader. Then, with a savagery unknown to the gentle people of Trollvik, the drooling demons butchered every man, woman and child as they lay trapped within the desecrated church walls. The beasts became known as trolls after the village that gave them a home. For five hundred years they terrorised the people from surrounding villages 
by snatching their children and roasting them over open fires like tender pieces of chicken. In the 16th century, King Magnus drove the trolls into the sea with a 10,000 strong army. But even today, Icelandic men and women still fear for the return of these homeless hounds from hell. But this is the stuff of mythology, and as we all know, trolls don't really exist. Not in Britain, anyway. When Simon sulked, the whole street knew about it. He even woke the dead from their dusty sleep. Simon, you see, was a stamper, a ranter, a pouter and a shouter. If he didn't get his own way, he would barricade himself into his room until he did. One day, he got rather a nasty shock. His mum and dad were moving to Devon, having sold their house to Mr and Mrs Torsveld, a nice couple from Reykjavik in Iceland. Simon had made it clear that he was not happy with the move. He didn't want to leave his friends at school, and he liked the penny chews that he could buy at the shop on the corner of their street. His mum and dad explained to him that he'd make new friends in the country, but Simon shut out their common sense by singing adverts at the top of his irritatingly flat voice. So it was hardly surprising that when Simon's mum took her po faced son to buy his new school uniform, Simon was less than cooperative with the lady in the shop. Puke, he said. The lady smiled awkwardly. You look like a proper little gentleman, she said to Simon. I look like a dustbin bag, replied Simon, studying the reflection of his blazer in the mirror. I won't wear it. He'll get used to it, whispered the lady to Simon's mum. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you, Miss Money-Grabbing Greedy Pants, he grouched, because you just want to sell something, but I've got to wear it, and I hate it. He glowered at his mum with eyes as large as two polished bowling balls in a tub of vanilla ice cream. Just pop it off, Simon, and let the nice lady pack it, chirruped his mum gaily, hoping to save the inevitable argument for home. But Simon never did as he was told. He sat down on the floor, thrust his hands in his pockets, and pushed out his jaw till he looked like a grizzly bear. Come along, dear. Let's not make an ugly scene in the shop. Simon's mum's forehead was beaded with sweat as customers poked their heads through the racked clothes to see what all the screaming was about. Simon had flung himself backwards across the display of sensible shoes and was kicking his legs in the air like a stranded beetle. I won't wear it. I'll spit and scream and throw up if you make me. I hate it more than I hate you, all of you. I don't want a smelly new uniform. I don't want to go to a ponky new school. And I don't want to move house. So I won't. That was telling them. The spectators looked away, tut-tutting beneath their precious flick fringes, horrified that Simon's mum could produce such a sulky son in public. When they got home, Simon's sulk was blacker than the Loch Ness Monster's liquid lair. His eyes had narrowed like arrow slits, his forehead had furrowed like a pair of Grandpa Joe's baggy corduroy gardening trousers, and his bottom lip was jutting out from his chin like the prow of an aircraft carrier. He stamped his spoiled feet on the hall rug and thumped upstairs like a bad-tempered baby rhino. You'll never see me again, he bawled as he slammed the door to his bedroom, and then, reopening the door to throw his new uniform out onto the landing. I hope I die in here, then you'll be sorry. Simon's mum and dad shared a despairing sigh as their son slammed his door for a second time and dislodged a trickle of plaster onto their heads. Then they returned to the depressing job of packing up their lives into tea chests before the removal men turned up at seven o'clock the following morning. They were up at five. Simon was woken by the pitter-patter of his parents' feet as they scurried up and down the stairs, shouting orders to each other. 
Don't forget the loo seat. We're not a charity, you know, said his dad. We can't take the loo seat. It's part of the house. Besides, what would the new owners sit on? Yeah, but it was me who bought it. Yes, and I bought the wallpaper, but we're not taking that with us, are we? Should we leave the light bulbs? Oh, for goodness sake, exploded Simon's mum. Why don't we just tear out the bricks and take the house with us? Good idea, bellowed Simon's dad as he drifted into the garden to roll up the lawn. Simon swung his legs out of bed and staggered over to the door. He was still half asleep. It was force of habit to go to the bathroom every morning before he got dressed, but just as he was about to turn the door handle, his mum cried out from the loft, Are you up yet, Simon? And he remembered what he'd said the night before. Under no circumstances was he leaving his room if his parents were still hell-bent on moving house. He ran his tongue round his khaki mouth and sat back down on his bed. If his mum and dad wanted a fight, they could have one. Simon! His mother was still trying to rouse him. Are you awake? No! shouted Simon. I'm having a lie-in! He heard a metallic clatter as his mum descended the loft ladder at speed, then her voice on the other side of the door, soft and cajoling. Oh, come on, precious, she whispered. You're not still angry with mummy, are you? Look, it's a beautiful day. Come on out and we'll discuss your problem. No problem, said Simon stubbornly, except with your hearing. I'm not leaving my bedroom and that's that. Then, having said his piece, he crawled back under his sheets and stuck his pillow over his head. All packing stopped. Simon's dad was called up from the garden where he'd been trying to uproot the sycamore tree, and both parents knelt outside their son's room, pleading with him to come out. It's no good sulking, bristled his dad. You have to move house with us. Can't make me? replied Simon. In fact, I'm going to hold my breath until you change your mind. And his face turned crimson. I shall charge this door down if I have to, threatened his dad. You won't get in, screamed the purple boy, realising too late that he had just taken a breath. Then, hopping swiftly out of bed, he pushed a chest of drawers in front of the door, just in case his father was foolish enough to try any shoulder heroics. He could hear his mum sobbing, but he knew that she was only trying it on to weaken his spirit. Oh, simple, please, Mr. Pyman, she simpered. Boo hoo, can't you hear how upset Mummy is? The removal men are due any minute. Can't hear a thing, chanted the boy, tunnelling his fingers into his ears and la lying at the top of his squeaky voice. Well, damn and blast you then, shouted his dad suddenly. You jolly well can stay there for all I care. His temper had got the better of him, and he flounced downstairs like a grand old knight of the theatre on hearing the news that his play was closing early. Simon was still la-lying when the removal men lifted the tailgate of their lorry and hopped into the cab. "'We'll see you in the new house, then,' said the foreman, doffing his baseball cap. "'We'll be right behind you!' shouted Simon's dad in a loud voice designed to carry through Simon's window. Oh, you're not really going to leave him, are you? begged his distraught wife. I mean, he is only ten years old. Of course not, explained Simon's dad. We'll pretend to leave with the removal van so that he thinks we've gone, but really we'll be just round the corner having a cup of tea. When we sneak back, he'll be downstairs having breakfast and we can nab him. But he's our son, not a burglar, said Simon's mum. You'll just have to trust me on this one, said Simon's dad. Besides, what harm can come to him in half an hour? <laughs> a couple of minutes later, Simon watched his parents drive away up the street without so much as a tutty by or have a good life. It would be foolish to pretend that he didn't view his isolation with a tinge of trepidation, but he'd guessed that they wouldn't really leave him. He was banking on them coming back, and when they did, 
he'd make sure they didn't catch him. He was staying right where he was. What Simon didn't know, however, is that sometimes being stuck behind a locked bedroom door is not the safest place to be. A few minutes later, he heard a key fumble in the front door and beamed a smug smile to himself for successfully predicting his parents' feeble plan. The bare floorboards in the hall creaked as his mum and dad tiptoed towards the kitchen. Simon laughed. So they had expected him to leave his room. He'd second-guess their every move. He heard his father snarl when he discovered the empty kitchen and their impatient footsteps as they scuffled back into the hall. The staircase groaned as they crept upstairs. Did they think he couldn't hear? It was pathetic. They were outside his bedroom door now. They shuffled to a halt, and then there was silence. Not just a quiet silence, but a silent silence. A long, heavy-duty pause, during which Simon became mesmerised by his own pulse rate. The longer it went on, the weightier it became, until at last Simon could bear the suspense no longer. So you came back, did you? He mocked. We certainly did, replied his mother's voice. Did we scare you? Asked his father. No, said Simon. I knew you'd be back. I meant just now when we crept up the stairs, whispered his father. His voice sounded strangely croaky like he had a cold. Simon bent down and put his eye up against the keyhole. It was his father, all right. He'd recognise that horrible brown furry jumper anywhere. I'm not scared, said Simon, and I'm not coming out either. Oh dear, said his mother simply. Not even if I say please. Simon heard a dog bark in one of the gardens that backed onto their house. I've told you a hundred times, he said. I'm not coming out till you say we're not moving. We're not moving, said his father quickly. I don't believe you, said Simon. You must think I was born yesterday. Simon, dear, came the soft tones of his mother. We want you out of the house now. Do you understand? Simon lay back on his bed and counted the lumps of plasticine stuck on the ceiling. They'd have to do better than that. Mr. and Mrs. Torsvelt are due any moment. What will they think if the house is still occupied? What's that stink? asked Simon obliquely, twitching the end of his nose. It smells like the elephant house at London Zoo. Unlock the door, continued his mother. Has one of you stepped in dinosaur poo or something? giggled the obstinate boy as a second dog answered the first with a long, baleful yowl. Well, even the dogs outside can smell it. He was enjoying this conversation about dino doo-doos so much that he failed to notice the change in his parents' tone. Gone were their calm requests. They were begging him now, with a desperation in their voices that was born of real danger. Help us, whimpered his father, Save us, Simon. Let us in. Save you from what? he queried. The wolves, sobbed his mother. The wolves are behind us. Their hot breath is on our backs. Oh, don't be stupid. They're just dogs. They belong to the neighbours. The howling had increased tenfold. They're only household pets. They're wolves, screamed his mother. Wolves! cried his father. In the name of God, save us before we're both killed. Simon was unsure of what to do. If he let his parents in and there were no wolves, he'd be in for a thorough pasting. But if his parents were telling the truth... Just then, a flickering red light danced outside his bedroom window and his parents redoubled their cries. The house is on fire! they wailed. Simon, we are your parents. We beseech you to let us in. Simon opened 
the door. His parents were standing on the landing with tears streaming down their faces. But there was no fire. They pushed their way into the room and locked the door behind them. Oh, very clever, said Simon sullenly. So you've tricked me. Well done. I suppose we'll be going to Devon now. But even as he spoke, his parents were changing shape. Shedding their comfortable knitwear, they transformed into snarling, slavering hounds from hell with wet lips and razor teeth and matted fur that stank to high heaven. Who are you? gasped the terrified boy. Trolls, said the one who had been his mother. What do you want? A new home, they growled together. Then with three swipes of their powerful claws, they tore Simon's head clean off the top of his petrified body. Seconds later, the doorbell rang. Simon's parents had returned to pick up their son. The door was opened by Mr. and Mrs. Torsfeld from Reykjavik. Hello, they said in their faltering English. Have you seen Simon? asked Simon's mum. No, said Mrs. Torsveld, with a look of concern in her bloodshot eyes. But you are most welcome to come inside to be looking for him. And she opened the door to let Simon's parents cross the threshold, while Mr. Torsveld smacked his lips and locked the door behind them. Later that evening, Mr. and Mrs. Torsveld had a barbecue in the back garden, roasting succulent pieces of chicken from three very large birds, I might add, over an open fire. For all you know, they may be your new neighbours. Why don't you sniff them and see? Oh!